Bienvenue à une séance vraiment hors série de sciences du passé humaine. Welcome to an extra series, a truly unusual, uh, exceptional uh, meeting of the science of the human past. Um, those of you who've been with us for a while know that we've been going on for quite some while, but you may not realize how deep and long our collaboration has been with uh, the distinguished tradition of archaeology in France. Today, we have a really wonderful event, an événement bilingue, uh, about a conference whose results are so fresh that my PowerPoint was completed at 2.54 p.m. today. So we are still thinking and discovering. We want to share with you the results of 72 hours of intensive work. I'm Michael McCormick. I have the privilege of being co-director with Johannes Kauza of the Max Planck Harvard Research Center for the Archaeoscience of the Mediterranean and uh, to chair the Initiative for the Science of the Human Past at Harvard. Uh, our conference, you can see the title, um, is uh, quite a fun one, Death, Pandemics. We know how much fun they are and we want to offer to, uh, to you uh, really fresh results of the research and discussions that have just concluded quite literally uh, minutes ago. Uh, our format will be simple. I will make a, a general introduction. Our uh, Max Planck Harvard Research Center postdoc, Dr. Solent Roadek, will offer some further thoughts. She is the one who's leading this research project. Then we'll hear as spokesperson for our colleagues. Uh, um, the, we have five of the most distinguished field archaeologists in France. One, Claude Renault, is supposed to be joining us online from southern France. Isabelle Catedu, an old friend, student of a certain Guy Philippard, who may be watching us off in cyberspace, um, and who first spoke at Harvard in the, our archaeology series. Um, should I say the year? Is that okay? Yeah. 2006. Uh, 2006. This is not uh, something new. We've been working together for a long time. So, and you'll hear from Isabel on behalf of the panel, and then we will open it up for discussion and conversation. And after that, we're going to go have a drink and some refreshments. Okay? Great. Bienvenue, donc. Uh, 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 the slides are, are bilingual. Um, I'll try to remember to speak the opposite language of the slide, but forgive me if I get mixed up and if I'm not clear, uh, just holler. Uh oh, okay, here we go. Okay, the uh, project that we're going to describe is funded by the Richard Lonsberry Foundation. Lonsberry was a Harvard alum of the class of, two, of 1906 who served uh, in France in the First World War and uh, afterwards decided he liked France and spent time there as an artist and uh, met a beautiful Russian immigrant living in Paris. And he and Vera uh, Viktorov were married and they lived a, biling a bilingual and a bicontinental existence for the next several decades. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Lounsbury founded the foundation to uh, support Franco-American scientific uh, and cultural communication. So it is thanks to them that we are here today and that this project will go forward. Uh, the Science of the Human Past, as many of you will know, is a uh, network of laboratories and seminars spread across different divisions of the university that come together to uh, advise and support and inspire one another. The members are drawn uh, from across the university and uh, each has a specialty of some aspect of the scientific and historical and archaeological investigation of the human past that overlaps with the other members in the network. We, the Science of the Human Past since 2016 has had the privilege of partnering with the Max Planck Society of Germany. We have created a virtual research center, not one penny spent on bricks, a virtual research center that has built a bridge between Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts and the Max Planck Institute for, Ar uh, for Evolutionary Anthropology today in Leipzig, Germany. It's a bridge, a pont entre le Max Planck de Leipzig et Harvard, un pont, pont qui désormais passe par la France. So it's a bridge which now has a French uh, connection, as it were. 
This is the uh, director's group of the Max Planck uh, Harvard Research Center. My co-director, Johannes Kauza, at the Max, runs the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Um, and our co-directors at Harvard are David Reich and Tina Werner in anthropology, archaeology. Philip Stockhammer, the Bronze Age archaeologist at Munich, is co-director in Germany. We have three graduate students who are at various stages of, of wonderful success in our programs, preparing PhDs. And they will be bilingual, not in French and English, but in genetics and and Greek and Latin and archaeology and isotopes. Um, we have before us, as I, I mentioned, five of the top field archaeologists in France. Uh, uh, Claude Renault uh, joins us, we hope, from afar. It's, it's late and uh, we, the connections are uncertain, but he may appear in the course of our meeting together. This is not something new. Uh, for 17 years, the science of the human past and its predecessor have been collaborating with French archaeologists and scientists. The first talk was given in 2005, and which showed how the giant accelerator in the pyramid below the Louvre, uh, there's a block, city block long particle accelerator beneath that <clears throat> clear, clear pyramid, how they're using that to identify the origins of the garnets in late antique jewelry. Uh, Merovingian jewelry. Turns out it comes from Sri Lanka in, in, in great part. In 2008, uh, we collaborated with the Bibliothèque Nationale de France to analyze the chemical composition of the coinage of Charlemagne and his son Louis the Pious with extremely interesting uh, results published in Revue Numismatique. Since 2016, Mom has been collaborating with Claude Renault and with the of the CNRS and INHAP in, in Languedoc in the investigation of strange burials from the early medieval period on this extraordinary area of the French coast, which was very active in the sixth and seventh centuries, including the island settlement of Magellana. The uh, Max Planck Harvard uh, Research Center has three intellectual focuses uh, within the broader area of biomolecular archaeology, human mobility and migration, the history of human health as uh, discovered through the ancient pathogens that are preserved in the molecules of the victims, the role of nutrition and health and how it changes over time, and how these things contribute to socioeconomic inequality in the human past. So the pandemic of Justinian has been a major focus of research for mom and uh, for many scholars in recent years. Bubonic plague is what we're talking about. It's a disease of rodents. Um, the bubonic form results in swift death. You die in two, three, four, five days. There's no time for the hard tissues to be affected. There is no visible traces on the bones of victims. The only way to detect it is from the DNA of the bacterium, l'ADN de, de la bactérie même, qui est conservé dans les restes microscopiques euh, du sang dans les dents, in the microscopic remains of blood in the teeth of the victims. And so this is how we have proceeded, and this is what we are focusing on. We get, we're looking for the ancient DNA of the bacillus of Yersinia pestis bubonic plague. We first knew for sure it was bubonic plague from the remains of a, a triple burial of two young women and a child uh, from the burial site of Aschheim from the sixth century in Germany, which gave ancient DNA of the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Why should we study this? What are the stakes for investigating the pandemic of Justinian? Some people think it wasn't important. Some people think it was. In terms of communications and commerce, it tells us about movements of ships, of wagons, of rats, of fleas. In terms of demographic impact, if it was anything like the Black Death, it will have had a serious demographic impact on the population of Europe. On the economic well-being of survivors, people forget plague's a very good thing if you survive because you inherit from everybody who died. So there's an enrichment on a per capita basis. How did it affect society in terms of settlement patterns, in terms of migrations? Uh, in the cities, uh, what was the impact? And uh, how did it affect deeper levels of civilization? There are people who believe, there are scholars who maintained that the cult of the virgin 
exploded in the time of the pandemic of Justinian. How did the care and the commemoration of the deceased change under the impact of events? If you think recent of how recently things developed in New York City under the impact of COVID. A tout seigneur, tout honneur, the study of the pandemic of Justinian was put front and center of modern medievalist research by the Dr. Jean, Jean-Noël Biraben, who was a specialist of the Black Death, and the distinguished French medievalist Jacques Le Goff, which, whom I had the privilege of meeting several times when he came to visit and give talks at my university, Université de Louvain in Belgium. They published a, a, a really path-breaking article in 1969 on uh, plague in the early Middle Ages in the celebrated journal Les Annales. So it's a controversial pandemic. And the question is of whether it was really important or something of little or passing impact. The vision of older scholarship, like that, the great work of Arthur Hugo Martin Jones, his history of the late Roman empire, he considered it to be insignificant. It happened, it was bad, they quickly recovered and, and civilization moved on. This argument, these kinds of arguments or this approach has been taken up again by more recent scholars such as Mordecai and uh, particularly Mordecai and Eisenberg. There's a very large group of scholars who have a different opinion, um, but there is a range. We have a range of diverse assessments running from the pandemic was an insignificant event. In fact, it was probably not even a pandemic to only the first outbreak in 542, three was really bad. The sub subsequent ones weren't really so significant. Um, the next 18 to 32 outbreaks over the next 200 years, not so important. And then another set of views, which believes that it was one of the most significant events to hit the Mediterranean basin and beyond in the last uh, 200, in, uh, over the entire 200 years of the outbreaks. How can we judge? How can we decide between these differing opinions? The first answer is we need more data. We need more evidence. Il faut multiplier les données pour avoir une réponse sûre. We got to get more data. Where do we get the data? From history and from philology, from the traditional sources exercised with a maximum of ability and care, from archaeology, as you will see and as we've been discussing, and from archaeogenetics, which depends on archaeology. First of all, history and philology, we've been creating a, a database with the help of our student uh, um, team, our undergraduates. We have two of our list program staffers here among us today, uh, a, a database of written sources, translations, and commentaries, which to which we now reveal the URL so that you can go and take a look at the beta version. Um, and you'll see that um, you can click on the list of outbreaks and go immediately to any source in the, uh, in the uh, source book. The first tranche of the source book has about, uh, we would guess maybe a third or a half of the existing sources. It's about 250 pages long. Um, and you'll find in each case an introduction, uh, the uh, translated text into English, a little textual commentary, and then the text in the original language whatever that language may be. Um, this, is, this is the wonderful team that has created the Justin Yang Pandemic website. So archeology, span very important. Obviously, that's what we're here for. The bioarchaeological bio approaches to disease, disability, and death in early medieval France. We've just had 72 hours of intensive discussion and analysis with five of France's top field archaeologists on these problems viewed in, across the entire territory of France. And we've asked the question, what does a pandemic look like archaeologically? How can we keep our eyes open as we move through the study of the pandemic to discover other disease events, to discover the role, the vision of disabled people in the early Middle Ages as reflected in the care of the communities that lived with them, that cared for them, and that buried them, and whom they influenced. The obvious place to look was mass graves, as we saw again in the case of COVID, burials of five or more people. Uh, the textual sources tell us there was a lot of them, uh, it was argued whether there were or there were not uh, many mass graves out there. I conducted a study over 10 years, which revealed in 50 different places, 80 plus different features of 
simultaneous burials of five or more people from the period of the Justinianic pandemic. So that was step one. You can see the chronological breakdown of the graves that were identified by 2016 there. This was also the beginning of the ability to identify more potential victims for molecular analysis of the ancient, seeking the ancient DNA of the bacterium in their teeth. And the pink are places where uh, mom was able to produce a whole series of new genomes in 20 and published in 2019. The definitive identification, as I mentioned, occurred in 2013 when two German, three, two German laboratories did three different sets of tests on eight different victims from one cemetery in Bavaria, and one of them came up positive in all three, and therefore we knew for sure this was Yersinia pestis. It was a triple burial, not a mass grave, as I mentioned. The second robust uh, identity, identification of the ancient DNA come, came from another sixth century cemetery in Bavaria, about uh, 30 kilometers away from the first at Aschheim. That was at by Michal Feldman, and that was a Max Planck Harvard uh, Research Center early, early operation. And the, the identification and recovery was so robust <laughs> that we were able to reconstruct a whole genome picture of that particular bacterium's genetics. But it's the discoveries were not limited to these two kind of more obvious places of mass and multiple graves. Working with Claude Renault, we also identified emergency burials, strange burials under totally unusual circumstances as potential sources. And indeed, at Lunel Biel, in a robber trench where people had dug up around 500 the stones of a Roman building to use them in new buildings, we discovered this, it, Claude excavated this person, and I think it was a she, uh, proved uh, positive for Yersinia pestis. And there are other structures that were used as emergency burials. Underground silos are very common in this period, and we find a number of skeletons in underground silos. In Spain, they're traditionally interpreted as skeletons, excuse me, as slaves, skeletons of slaves. Uh, uh, but um, we have strong reason to believe that, um, among other reasons, that people were buried here is because they died of plague, as you will see in forthcoming publications. The last element stems from the archaeology, and that is archaeogenetics, um, and that comes from that whole genome recovery of 2016 that I referred to. By sequencing the entire genome of the bacterium, you're able to establish the phylogeny. The phylogeny is like a genealogy of the bacteria, just as COVID mutates as it moves through the population. You can tell who got it from whom by the accumulation of mutations that are the telltale story of its trail through the human population. So too with bubonic plague and the bacteria. And so in multiplying genomes, we can establish the genealogy of the spread of Yersinia pestis through the late Roman population and map its spread in time and space with quite extraordinary precision to the point that one can almost see the boats that transported the rats that brought the disease to different places. So um, we were able to identify it in, I think, ultimately eight, we have eight new genomes from across Europe. Uh, the study was led by Marcel Keller. And um, we were able, this was particularly with the uh, elements recovered from, with, by uh, Claude Renault, which you can see, it's not working, uh, up at Lunel Viel, up at the top. Uh, you can see how the different genomes uh, are integrated into an overall provisional picture of the spread of the Yersinia pestis. We need more genomes. We need better ones to be able to fill this in. This is something that went on for 200 years and covered all of Western Europe, all of North Africa and East, uh, Western Asia. So the most extraordinary outbreak or the most extraordinary genome was that recovered from Britain, which as you can see, lies at the base of the uh, expansion of the uh, pathogen. That is to say, um, very close to, according to the written sources, Alexandria and Egypt, where it began, somehow it reached Britain within, within months or a year or two of the outbreak of the epidemic, judging from this initial phylogenetic evidence. That's quite unexpected. So that's where we are today. Uh, that's where we were when we organized our workshop. 
And now I'm going to turn things over to Solent Choadek, who has been working furiously to summarize the results of the meeting that concluded shortly before we convened here. Solent, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's really, really nice to see people in person and also online. So my presentation is going to be very short and very much to the point because I think it will be much better to actually leave more time to a discussion. And so you can ask your questions and what you're interested in. So I'm just going to provide you with an overview of what we've been talking about in the past two days with our collaborators from France. So it's really the launch of this international collaboration between France, we've seen the Max Planck Institute and also Harvard. Oh. Uh, very, very quickly first, I wanted to tell you a bit about how French archaeology works and how it's organized. So France is very lucky because we consider archaeology an integral part of our heritage and therefore it is managed by the state. So the ministry is at the very top and then we have um, administration um, organizations. So you have the Regional Direction of Cultural Affairs, the DRAC, and on a smaller unit, you have the Regional Services of Archaeology, who are the depositories of all the information we have, and that's organized by regions. Uh, on the research side, you have different organizations. So one of them is the National Council for Archaeological Research. You have the National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, which a lot of people are generally familiar with. You also have the National Institute for Rescue Archaeology, the INRAP, for which we have a lot of members present with us today, and we're very thankful for that. And you also have private organizations. This project, our project, is in collaboration with these various organizations. And that is allowing us to cover the entirety of the French territory. And it's also allowing us to have specialists on different topics. So we have people who are anthropologists who are looking really at the bones of the individuals. Uh, we have people who are looking at the grave goods and other elements you can find in the grave. We have other people who are looking at the context, the big picture, if you will. So we really have um, a number of experts that are helping us understand what we are seeing in the ground in France and putting it back into this context and these questions about death, diseases, but also generally health of ancient populations. So thanks to this collaboration so far, and we've only been working on the areas you can see on this map, uh, we've already been able to um, notice 100, uh, 1,000, sorry, 113 localities. So these are towns, and this is what you see on the map. And that corresponds to 1,625 funerary sites. So these are places where you will have dead people for the period 400 to 1,000 CE. And I'm including anything. So I'm including a single grave that has just been noticed by someone digging in their garden, which is more likely than you might think. Uh, I'm also including cemeteries of several thousands of individuals because we do have those. Uh, so this is just like what we know and what we know death, the death landscape looks like in France for this period. What we're going to do now is actually look at these individual points and check how they are treating their dead and what that can tell us. So in the past two days, we've actually started to think about how we're going to do this, because obviously this is a huge amount of information that we need to take into account and that we need to analyze. So we started to bring uh, everybody together and ask true questions and think about, oh, what bias might we have in the study of past societies and how they react to uh, a pandemic? situation to a mass death. We've seen today with COVID that every country reacted differently, that we didn't react the same way at first. And then our understanding changed, our perception of the disease changed. And even today, we're still like in between. We're not fully understanding the situation we're in. We keep talking about the new normal. So what does the new normal looks like for past societies? And how can we see that as archeologists? 
We've also addressed some practical and ethical questions because we are dealing with human remains. And of course, we want to do this respectfully. And we also want to respect all the laws and legislations that have been put in place to protect this kind of information. Because what we're doing is we're extracting DNA to identify diseases. And so this is a very big question. And we are very, very careful about how we do it and why we do it. We have very clear objectives. We really want to understand what's the place of these individuals in their society. How did they die? Why did they die? Where are they put in the cemeteries? Are they put in the cemeteries? All of these questions and be sure to be able to provide a clear answer. And again, thinking about the big picture, what are we gonna do with this data? And Mike was starting to mention this. France is one part of the picture. And fortunately for us, it's a part that is very well documented archeologically. As you saw, we have a lot of sites. So we have a huge potential. And thanks to the INRAP, we have a lot of very, very good and very good quality data that we can actually use and make a good selection for our future studies. And of course, during two days, between very good food and very nice uh, intellectual conversations, we have been able to create strong links building on previous relationships and also building, just meeting each other and discovering new people. And that has been very, very lovely. But the most important for us and for research, and I'm talking research with a, a capital R, is that we're building something that's long lasting and that will provide us with clear and scientific verified answers once we launch all of these analysis. So that's all for me because I want to let my colleagues speak a bit more, but thank you very much. Good afternoon and thanks for being here. Um, and again, so many thanks, uh, Mike and Solen, for um, your wonderful welcome. Um, so our work in preventive archaeology is to detect, excavate, and undertake the scientific study of archaeological remains on land, but also underwater, that might otherwise be destroyed by land development work, and that following a decision made by the state. So archaeologists from INRAP intervene on site in order to safeguard safeguard its legal heritage. And it is important to say that every year, 700 of square kilometers are affected by land development projects. And actually we analyze around 20% of this total area. Over the past 20 years, 50,000 sites have been discovered by INRAP and 5,000 have been archaeological sites have been excavated, enriching our knowledge about the past. Actually, in France, we find a site every 800 meters or every kilometers, and that sheds lights on very important regional or micro regional diversities. This opportunistic archaeology allows us to excavate very large surfaces. I mean, uh, several hectares, dozen, sometimes hundreds of hectares. So in this case, we have the wonderful opportunity to study not only a settlement, but also cemeteries, the landscape, and the natural environment of the site. For example, here in Picardy, the site of Salleux, before the construction of, of a highway, we found an entire cemetery dating back to the seventh century and continuing to the 11th, with inside one of the first early medieval wooden church. But not only, around it was developing a large settlement with houses, houses, craft activities, agriculture, husbandry, uh, all established along a river. So we were able to document not only the everyday life of these peasants, what, we, what they ate with waste in, into, into the trash, cultivated or cultivated and icing on the, on the cake, the landscape again, 
resources, the natural environment at various scales, and climate conditions. Thanks to the preservation of wood near the river, we found a mill actually, fish, bones, plants, but also pollens. And we also document the, the funerary practices inside the cemetery, like you see here on the, on the picture. Because in this cemetery, we found about uh, 1,300 graves and about 2,000 individuals. Grave goods and funeral practices also provide data that reveal social status of men and women and diverse multicultural societies. In the early Middle Ages, the deceased are usually buried in a wooden coffin dressed with some clothing accessories like a knife, a belt buckles or pottery. But sometimes the deceased are buried in a prestigious way, for example, in an excavated funerary chamber with numerous weapons, jewels of gold, silver or garnet and prestigious dishes of copper alloy. And uh, we have here the site of Saint-Dizier excavated uh, the excavation directed by, by my colleagues, Marie-Cécile Tru. These are typical customs may reveal a foreign influence or even an origin, such as the Frankish one in this case. Some precious objects have a distant origin, testifying to the liveliness of the exchanges in this period. And this is now the reconstruction of this aristocratic burial excavated in Saint-Dizier. How a community treats death, the care afforded to the body, the funerary procedures that follow are fundamental, are fundamental acts, defining the social dimension of humanity and medieval societies. So it is very important to understand and reconstruct the fundamental sequence of gestures Skeleton material offer a huge amount of reliable data, not only about the age, sex and the, uh, of the deceased, but also their physical condition at the time death. Their health, the pathologies that affected their communities, as well as the environment in which they lived. We have found, for example, exam example of traumatic, uh, with broken bones, inflammatory pathologies, infections, infectious one, or even degenerative, but also nutritional problems. Another new subdiscipline focuses on how pathologies disable an individual. And for my colleague Valérie Delattre, who is the specialist of this kind of studies, examples show that in these early medieval communities, disability and diseases do not seem to have led to social exclusion. These adults, some unable to walk or work or live on their own, survive sometimes into old age with caretaker support, some benefiting from sophisticated med medical procedures. Some diseases could also be buried out of the cemetery, actually excluded because of sometimes social inequality, beliefs, different beliefs or contagious risk. Analysis and comparison of reliable serial data from well-dated cemeteries now allow us to identify peaks pointing to mortality crisis affecting particular population at specific moments. For example, here in the Issoudun site excavated by my colleague Philippe Blanchard, probably signal a smallpox epidemic. That, so for Middle Ages, in this case, especially written sources can cross archeological and biochemical studies to identify the different pandemics has the Black Death, for example, but showing how interdisciplinary approach 
is fundamental, is essential to continue this kind of work. Thank you for attention. It's a pleasure to hear your voice at Harvard. Um, and thank you all. Um, we now open the floor to your questions here live among us and those of you who may be much more remote and joining us online. Uh, so then we'll keep an eye on the any questions that may come in online. I'll be here. Feel free to pose your question in French or English um, and um, our speakers and researchers will happily answer in whatever language they wish and Solen and I will make sure we can get it into a language that you wish. Okay, so the floor is open, friends. Sir. Um, I have a technical question. Uh, you, you in your introduction, uh, um, showed a phylogenetic tree of Yersinia um, and showing that the, uh, um, the British and the Bavarian um, clades were sister group. And then you had a little notch at the bottom, which was the root. And my question is, what is the outgroup? What is the root for you? What do you use to root uh, this tree? Uh, so they go back to in, uh, Yersinia and Terocolitica. We now have Yersinia going back to the Bronze Age, Yersinia pestis going back to the Bronze Age. And so we use, we start from there and work our way forward. What I showed was simply an excerpt from the overall phylogenetic tree, uh, focusing on the results of the 2019 publication. Of course, as you may know, um, the um, Max Planck group uh, under Johannes Krause has just published quite a remarkable study last week in Nature, uh, which finally uh, resolved the century long debate about the origins of the Black Death uh, for the uh, Yersinia pestis, the bacteria of Yersinia pestis was identified in a cemetery of Nestorian Christian merchants living in Central Asia along the uh, Silk Road in two cemeteries which um, had numerous uh, tombstones written in Syriac um, explaining that these people had, many of these people had died in an epidemic, a terrible epidemic in 1339. Uh, the Black Death uh, was identified, it emerged for the European consciousness at Kaffa Feodosia in present day occupied Ukraine uh, in 1346-47. And uh, the phylogenetic picture there is quite remarkable because the bacterium that's present in these two cemeteries in Central Asia is the direct ancestor of the one that appears in Europe in 1347-1348. Hope that's helpful. Wonderful question. Thank you. Résumé français ou bien ça va? Well, sir. You mentioned and you all spoke about very early antiquity, relatively speaking, yes, yes. The late Roman, and then you jump to the 14th century. What happened in between regarding the, the decline in awareness? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, the, the question is, uh, we focused uh, on uh, late antiquity and an early period, the sixth century, and then we just uh, jumped to the 14th century. So uh, we now know that there are two, three historically recorded pandemics of plague, of bubonic plague. The first historically recorded one uh, is that of that breaks out in Pelusium in the second port of Egypt in 1341-1342. Excuse me, I, I am sorry. Correction, whoa! The first one breaks out in Egypt in the Nile Delta in Pelusium in 541-542 in the sixth century. And that is the one, that is what we believe was the origin of the uh, of the uh, phylogenetic extract of the, of the Justinianic pandemic. And Amazingly, uh, these individuals buried in the other Cambridge, Greater Cambridge, in the middle of the sixth century, show something that is very close to what must be the origin of the, set, the first pandemic of plague. That continued until about 750, and then it just dies out for reasons we do not know. And then there's no more bubonic plague known of in Western Eurasia. Uh, in texts or archaeologically or um, uh, archaeoscientifically demonstrated until this outbreak that begins in Feodosia, in Kaffa, in a Genoese trading colony. Uh, and that's the beginning of the second pandemic in the middle of the 1300s. That continues into the 1720s. 
Um, it has terrible effects in Marseille because they uh, some uh, juggling the paperwork for the ship allowed it to get in and the contagion came with it. So that was the last big outbreak. There will continue to be plague in Russia uh, after the 1720s. Then it dies down and the third pandemic begins in China in the second half of the 19th century and spreads around the globe, including to the United States. And that's when we got it for our prairie dogs because bubonic plague is, as you may know, endemic in the Southwestern United States. Do not pet the prairie dogs. They are the vector. They are the hosts of bubonic plague. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Okay. Uh, so, sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, Thomas Sackmore from the Rockefeller University is asking if there is any indication that the cause of death, infectious or otherwise, affected the condition of interment. So I'm going to translate that for our panelists and maybe put them. Excellent. Uh, donc Thomas uh, Sackmore de l'Université de Rockefeller uh, demande si il y a des indications que la cause de la mort qu'elle soit infectieuse ou autre, a eu un, avait des impacts directs sur euh, la manière dont les gens étaient enterrés ou les conditions euh, sous lesquelles les gens étaient enterrés. Tu peux utiliser. Bonjour à tous. Donc, moi, je peux vous parler de handicap et de corps différents. C'est Valérie Delattre. Oui, Valérie, Valérie Delattre. Euh, Lorsque nous avons commencé cette recherche sur l'archéologie du handicap qui concernait toutes les périodes et bien évidemment le haut Moyen-Âge, notre première question a été de savoir si ces personnes handicapées, ces personnes vulnérables bénéficiaient d'un traitement funéraire particulier qui pouvait être de la relégation topographique, une mise à l'écart du cimetière communautaire ou si au sein du cimetière, ils bénéficiaient de pratiques particulières, soit de euh, injures faites aux cadavres soit de diffamation ou au contraire de survalorisation. Alors, Et on va traduire. <laughs> okay. So Valérie was saying that one of their primary question when they started to look at disability in death was to understand if there was actually um, relegation to the outside of the cemetery, if there is an area that's dedicated to these people or if they're not even buried in the cemetery or if uh, they have they are treated in a, in a bad way so um, something that would be humiliating, for example, or um, like disrespectful, disrespectful exactly. Thank you, Professor McCormick. Um, or on the contrary, if they were um, treated in a good way and in a very, very good way. So are they, do they have a value in a sense? Are they treated as very important members of the community? And, and if I may emphasize what is beautiful about the work of our colleagues at the INRAP, and starting with Valérie, is the fact that they are looking at a much bigger picture than just plague. They are looking at the broad picture of the, the burial of diseased or disabled people uh, across the millennia, going back to the uh, Paleolithic, or at least the uh, Mesolithic, Chal Chalcolithic uh, period. I don't know when your burials begin. And so this much bigger horizon allows us to see very rare instances because they recur over the millennia. And I shiver at some of the revelations, the insights that emerge from Valérie's work. But in any of Valérie, if she et, continue, vous voulez continuer. Et donc, on dit souvent que euh, le, le, dans le cimetière, la position des squelettes et la façon dont ils ont enterré reflète le statut social que les, les individus avaient de leur vivant. Et donc, on n'observe aucune exclusion, aucune mise en scène particulière, au contraire de la valorisation. Et donc, cette façon de lire le traitement des personnes en situation de vulnérabilité dans la mort nous renvoie au statut qu'ils avaient de leur vivant. Et on sait qu'à travers les siècles, notamment au Moyen Âge, ils étaient pris en charge, soignés, réparés et accompagnés par leurs proches tout au long d'une vie qui pouvait être amoindrie, affaiblie et où ils étaient euh, euh, vraiment accompagnés dans leurs gestes quotidiens. Ça va Oui, yeah. taking notes at the same time. <laughs> So the result of this uh, investigation was to actually show 
that there was no exclusion. So different people were not excluded from the, from the cemetery. They were not treated in a bad way. They're not, not treated in a humi humiliating way. And that is giving us a lot of information about their status in life. What we're seeing is that they were actually taken care of by their community. And some of them actually reached very old age. So the, the whole community came to help them and maintain them in a good uh, way of life and making accommodations for them. So there is no exclusion during life and there is no exclusion in death either. There was, in fact, uh, you may have noticed on one of uh, pro uh, Professor Katadu's slides, a beautiful picture of a Merovingian prothesis for someone who had had an amputated hand. Um, they were buried with their prothesis, which was attached to their arm by a metal and leather fixture. Um, so the uh, care of those who were vulnerable, if we start with a broader category of human beings who are vulnerable in their lifetime, we can see a broad range of ways of treating these people in life and after life. But we are surprised as archaeologists and historians looking at the past to see the high regard and the care that was generally meted out to those who were vulnerable within a given population. That said, it is also true that we are beginning to observe now that we have uh, positive evidence of the presence of bubonic plague in buried individuals, differences in the way they were buried. And in that, I anticipate on the next question, I see there's one that you may wanna read for uh, us all. Yes. So there is no, another question on the chat uh, from Naomi Redford. Uh, so Naomi is asking, is it possible to identify changes in social practices arising from past pandemics? Uh, donc pour, uh, est-ce qu'il est possible d'identifier des changements dans les pratiques sociales comme un résultat uh, des pandémies des pandémies passées? Je peux commencer. Donc, euh, en, en, en parlant des sources euh, écrites, et puis on peut renf euh, renforcer avec ce que nous avons pu voir dans les, hein, dans les, dans les, dans les, les, les fouilles. So, that's a wonderful question. Uh, and in fact, in the case of the first pandemic of bubonic plague, we have a rich written record of the initial outbreak, 541, 542, 543, particularly from the capital of the Roman Empire at that time, Constantinople, modern Istanbul. We have two eyewitnesses who give us in great detail the story of the plague there. And the one they tell us is one that is troublingly close to what we lived ourselves in the spring of 2020. And that is this, that when the strange new disease appeared out of nowhere in the spring of 542 in the imperial capital, a few people died at first. And at the beginning, the normal funerary practices were followed with an, an escort and a burial in the family tomb and, and the various funerary rituals that were quite typical of the time. But as the dead mounted, as the numbers increased, into the hundreds and into the thousands, and indeed, according to the sources, tens of thousands, um, the picture was completely changed and it became necessary for the Roman Emperor Justinian, the codifier of Roman law, to organize the security forces of the Imperial Palace to go and dig gigantic trenches in which thousands of people were transported out of the Imperial City from the streets where they lie rotting to the burial places uh, across, the, uh, across what is today the Golden Horn and across the uh, Straits of uh, the Bosporus uh, to Chalcedon and to uh, uh, Kerikui on the other side of, in Asia, just across the water from Istanbul. That's the written sources. Mais on a aussi la documentation maintenant archéologique. Est-ce qu'on voudrait faire des commentaires là-dessus? Ben, on, on remarque qu'en fait, les, les structures euh, funéraires se sont adaptées au fur et à mesure des, des crises. Notamment, euh, il y a eu des réponses avec, euh, euh, notamment on le voit à East Smithfield en Angleterre, où les, les structures sont devenues plus importantes. On a commencé à creuser des tranchées ou des grandes fosses euh, pour euh, s'adapter 
à la mortalité qui était de plus en plus importante, jusqu'à finir à Marseille en 1720, dans la, pour la troisième pandémie, de, euh, dans la, deuxième pandémie, la fin de la deuxième pandémie, à, à, creuser, à anticiper euh, et à creuser des structures, des grandes fosses qui n'ont pas été complètement euh, remplies, notamment lors de la rechute de 1722. Euh, à Marseille, il y a nos collègues de, de Marseille ont fouillé des fosses qui, étaient, qui étaient énormes et qui ont été remplies de quelques dizaines d'individus simplement. Ils avaient anticipé en creusant de très grosses fosses. Donc, ils se sont adaptés. So, yes, what we see is actually the funerary uh, structures adapt as we go through different pandemics. And we have examples in England where we have, so for the second pandemic, uh, we have very, very wide trenches that are dug in prevention for the number of dead we're going to have. And then people are buried together in these very wide trenches. And we have something similar happening in Southern France in uh, 1722, yes. in 1722, where they dug, so these big, big, big trenches in preparation for a peak in mortality for a lot of people dying. And actually they didn't fill them up fully because they were just reacting and being like okay we're going to be safe we're going to do this big big trench to be able to bury people quickly and in the end it wasn't that bad but it shows that people in the societies adapted to the various pandemic through time and that's also something we've seen i think with covid uh, unfortunately in the recent years the first reaction we had to the pandemic were generally you know, carrying on with our normal practices and then depending on the countries and the number of dead, we had to adapt the way we were burying our dead and also mourning. And that's something that is visible today with our modern technology and our ability to project uh, population death and understand viruses. So it's not like we are really seeing today the kind of situation people of the past were confronted to. And if I may add on all of this as well, uh, so not only when we study dead people and funerary practices, do we study how people reacted to death, but we are also understanding how people lived, because you have to remember people don't bury themselves. So what is what the, a skeleton is giving us as an information, what a grave is giving us as an information is not only about that individual, it's about their place in their society, it's about Yeah, everything the society is doing to react to specific situations. It can be just a normal death, an end of life, or it can be something traumatic, or it can be something of an epidemic. And all of this information is contained within the grave. We just need to know how to look and where to look. Thank you. Um, it's, and it is important to emphasize that the initial uh, archaeological discoveries uh, and cases of, of absolute robust identification of bubonic plague in the remains of victims occurred in what appear to be normal burials of the time with careful preparation of the bodies dressed, um, as you saw from the slide about the second one from Alton Erding, the one where we were able to get a whole genome picture of Yersinia pestis. They were buried with very uh, expensive jewelry um, and weapons and so forth, their normal gear in the normal fashion of the time with the normal ritual of a village in Bavaria in the sixth century. Um, Uh, and on the other hand, at the, at the other extreme, we have the very strange burials that we showed you an example of from southern France, from Nunelville, where within, and this came out, actually, this has just emerged in our discussions uh, yesterday, that uh, in the robber trench, uh, a large, long robber trench from which the Roman foundation stones had been removed around 500, and in which that person who we showed splayed had been dumped, there were seven people who were dumped in that trench and five of them were dumped. You can tell that if from their, their skeleton's position, um, uh, Solène Trodec is an eminent specialist in being able to read the tiniest aspects of the gestures that are preserved in the skeletons as they're being excavated. You can tell that this person was heaped with two, with two people, one holding the, uh, the wrists and the other the ankles. Um, and yet at the end of that trench, there are two women who are placed on their backs with little stones placed under their head as cushions. So even within this extraordinary 
uh, anomalous burial, uh, em emergency burial in which certain of the dead who we know died of plague were pitched in, yet 10 meters from them at the same time, two women were placed with care and some kind of love uh, in this terrible tragedy that affected this village on the southern French coast, right, right off the Etang d'Or, for those of you who know Languedoc. Uh, hmm? So we see a spectrum, and this will be our mission to discover what happened, how it happened, and how we can use the most infinitely small remains of physical movements, of molecular patterns to recover a terrible event in the lives of individuals and in the life of a society, but also a terrible event which shows us some of the more remarkable aspects of the society, caring for people in the most abysmal of circumstances, far beyond COVID. Remember the mortality rate for COVID, I believe in the United States is 0.002. The mortality rate for bubonic plague without antibiotics is 40 to 60 percent. Other questions? And from abroad, ma'am. Um, this is not a plague related question. I hope it's okay to go back to this, to this disabled um, skeleton question, but I'd be fascinated to know if you're able to tell from the way people are buried who are disabled if there's a difference between those who are disabled perhaps in life, perhaps through war, war hero burials versus those who are born with disabilities. So in other words, are you able to differentiate among the disabilities and is the treatment of those um, different from skeleton to skeleton? I don't know if your sample is big enough to be able to Beautiful differentiate. Questions. Indeed, well, we have the world's expert right here. Donc la question c'est est-ce euh, qu'on est capable de remarquer des de déterminer si c'est euh, un handicap de naissance ou si c'est un handicap qui résulte par exemple d'une guerre ou quelque chose quelque chose comme ça et si si oui est-ce qu'on voit une différence dans le traitement entre les gens qui sont nés euh, handicapés et les gens qui le sont devenus devenus tout, tout dernièrement tout récemment avant le avant la, avant la, leur mort quoi alors, travailler sur le handicap dans les populations du passé, c'est inventer des pathologies, parce qu'on ne peut pas se calquer sur nos propres définitions du handicap. Le handicap sensoriel, le handicap mental, cognitif, ne sont pas lisibles okay, sur les je vais, squelettes. Ça, <laughs> uh, so, what the first thing we need to think about is how we define disability. So. In an archaeological population, you can't see someone who is mentally disabled. You can't see someone who is blind. So the first step was actually to define what we mean, or actually they mean, by disabled. Et donc, en archéologie, un sujet est considéré comme étant handicapé quand il, est, il a été empêché, entravé, contraint dans son quotidien par une maladie congénitale ou par un accident de vie, une chute de cheval, une fracture. On contextualise toujours. Alors, bien évidemment, tous les handicaps nous sont lisibles quand ils ont laissé une trace sur l'os. Et on voit aussi la réparation, les soins chirurgicaux. Tu veux y aller mmh. So in archaeology, you will be able to notice a trauma and you will be able to notice some, some, uh, something someone is born with. So I'm going to just use an example. Uh, for example, un nain, so someone who's born with dwarfism, you will see it on the bones. Someone who fell from a horse and broke their leg or something like that, you will see it. So you will be able to differentiate someone who is born with a pathology, uh, a disability, sorry, and someone who had an accident or as you were saying, um, some a wound result, resulting from a war or something like that. And you will also be able to see if there has been any attempt to treat it. And for example, someone again who breaks their arm, you are going to be able to see if there was, uh, they were trying to actually maintain the arm together so that it fix itself. You will be able to see, and we saw again, these example with prosthetics. So you, you can see what the people are putting in place to treat The disability. Et effectivement, je travaille beaucoup sur les amputations et les prothèses. Et donc, euh, 
les, les prothèses sont fabriquées aussi bien pour une personne handicapée qui souffre d'un handicap de naissance, la génésie d'un membre, un, manque, un membre qui lui manque à la naissance, ou par exemple, à la suite d'une guerre, un champ de bataille, euh, un chirurgien ampute, et on va appareiller et inventer une prothèse. Le, la nature du handicap n'est pas un critère dans le comportement que les, les, les proches peuvent avoir et dans le traitement, la réparation et les soins. Ça n'importe pas. So you will be able to see, actually, if someone is born without a limb, for example, or if someone has been amputated as a result, so you will be able to see that on the bone. And what we're seeing is that there is no difference in the treatment. So there is no difference in the way people are treated during their life and also no difference in the way people are treated during their death. So it's exactly the same whether the person is born disabled or if they become disabled later in life. Uh, yes. Professor Green. Merci. Uh, je pense que je peux parler en français. Enfin, je vais essayer. Uh, donc, je, je suis cette question. Et, et si une personne a été amputée uh, comme punition, je pense que ça se pratiquait dans vos périodes, l'amputation d'une main, l'amputation du nez. On a des... quelques exemples de sépultures oui. avec des, 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 des squelettes. Oui, peut-être. Ah, oh, pardon. On va tra traduisant la question. Pour... Je pense que tout le monde oui. est français. Et est-ce que tu as fini, Virginie, ou tu veux Oh, you, you want me to translate my question in English? <laughs> Or, or I don't no, know. let Solène do it. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, the question was, what about when the amputation, amputation is the result of a like a judgment or something like that? So if we have, I don't know, a thief's hands Penalty cut off. For a crime. Yeah. On a des textes qui nous parlent de châtiments corporels qui sont appliqués à des sujets. On coupe notamment les mains. On a des sépultures dans lesquelles les mains sont absentes. Il nous est difficile, lorsque l'on lit sur les ossements euh, la trace d'une amputation, de savoir si elle a été à des fins punitives ou si le sujet est mort sur la table d'opération, par exemple. Donc, le, le lien entre amputation et châtiment, plus le texte, il est tentant, mais il est difficile à affirmer. Nous avons des cas où nous avons des individus qui ont souffert uh, amputation de l'amputation des mains, mais il est difficile de dire from the uh, remains, whether this is a criminal who has been condemned to the amputation of the hands, which was the standard penalty at this time, uh, or someone who was undergoing a medical treatment or had an accident of some sort and suffered in this way. Je m'imagine que dans le cas où les deux mains sont enlevées, on a cette indication plus sérieuse. Non, l'exemple de cutterie euh, qu'on a montré avec la prothèse en fer, c'est pas quelqu'un qui a été puni. Donc, les deux mains. Il avait les deux mains amputées, probablement une chute de cheval, une chute ou d'un escalier. Les deux mains étaient amputées et l'une de ses mains était appareillée avec une prothèse inventée par le forgeron du village. Mais en aucun cas, euh, le soin, l'investissement et le coût d'un cet objet ne peut être mis, en, être mis en relation avec une sanction pénale, quelle qu'elle soit. Entendu. So the, um, yeah, here's the slide of that uh, prothesis. And uh, um, uh, Valérie uh, informs us that in this case, the person with the prothesis actually had had both hands amputated some considerable time before death. And there are indications that this person fell from a horse and broke both hands and suffered amputation as a result of that. So in this case, we can probably rule out uh, a penal amputation, but in general, it, this is very, very difficult to do. Uh, this is a very special case. And in this case, as individuals, the village blacksmith created a prothesis for one of the, this man's arms and he was able to continue uh, his life in this fashion. Hmm? Oui. Là, on a euh, un sujet mérovingien dans l'est de la France, donc qui a été amputé des deux mains, et une de ses mains a été appareillée avec quelque chose qui a été fabriqué uniquement pour lui. So he's from the eastern France, and this was this was made specifically for him, quite clearly, um, this unusual uh, device. It happens that we have present in the room the world's greatest expert on bodily mutilation in late antiquity in the Middle Ages, who defended his dissertation on this very subject um, seven days ago. 
Um, and I don't know if you have any comments to make on other cases that you may be familiar with, Dr. Ransahoff. Gives me pleasure to use that term for the first time. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, in terms of the hand, you know, it puts me in the mind of uh, there is a, a Byzantine rebel from the 10th century uh, known as Basil the Copper Hand, who was a, <laughs> a, a peasant um, who had his hand mutilated, uh, cut off as a judicial penalty. Uh, and he apparently had a hand made of copper that was, as far as we can tell from our sources, actually attached, it seems like in a very similar way to this hand. Um, and then had a, a subsequent career as a, a rebel. He actually posed as a as a deceased emperor at one point. Um, but he was from a relatively low low background, oh. and it seems that this hand was made um, in the context of a, of a local village in Anatolia. So this was something that happened at least in the Byzantine world as well that we can tell from mm -hmm. literary sources. I don't know of any archaeological mm -hmm. findings, uh, but it's really interesting to see that parallel across the Mediterranean. Donc, ce que Jake était en train de dire, c'est qu'il a un cas um, au Xe siècle uh, de quelqu'un qui s'appelait, what was it, Basil Copperhead? Basil Copperhead. <laughs> Donc, Basil, la, la, main de, la main de fer, enfin, pas de fer, mais de, mettre, de cuivre. Et uh, où on sait que c'est un cas d'amputation de, de, pénale qui a un lien avec, mais ils ont quand même fait voilà, une prothèse. Et apparemment, c'était quelqu'un qui avait un statut assez... Uh, assez intéressant dans la société. Il était d'origine euh, plutôt basse, voilà. euh, mais il a évidemment connu une carrière un peu plus intéressante. Euh, et donc, il y a toute raison de quoi, euh, selon le professeur, euh, le docteur, soon to be professeur, ah, non, Ransahov, non, non, non. Il, est, il y a tout lieu, de, oui, euh, oui, à Byzance, ah. et il y a tout lieu de croire que le, le, la prothèse a été fabriquée dans son, son village, oui, oui. où il était un petit, un petit rien, jusqu'au moment où il a fait un petit essor dans la société. Mais, pa pa parfois, les, les prothèses, on le voit notamment, nous, pour la fin du Moyen-Âge, c'est quelque chose, c'est la mise en scène du guerrier, c'est la mise en scène du valeureux, on le voit ça, on voit, on voit ça chez les aristocrates qui vont à la guerre, ils se font des prothèses militaires qui sont faites par les fabricants d'armures, et là qu'on soit euh, très euh, un, un, un chevalier avec des nobles qualités ou un petit peu un margoulin de bas étage, la prothèse est quelque chose qui, euh, qui est une, une valorisation du statut lié à la guerre, lié à la bataille, lié à, 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 à cette sphère guerrière, en tout cas. Donc, Mais, une prothèse pour quelqu'un qui a perdu un membre. Oui, oui, ça. oui. Uh -huh. et, et qui sont fabriqués par les, les fabricants d'armure. Donc, ça, elles, sont, elles commencent ça. à être articulées avec ça. des crémaillères pour les doigts. Elles sont à la fois esthétiques et fonctionnelles. C'est ça, c'est ça que je veux traduire. Okay. Uh, and we have indeed cases from the late Middle Ages of uh, uh, aristocratic warriors who have lost a limb in combat and who have their armorers make for them battle prothesis um, that they display quite proudly as they go into battle. Go ahead, try chop this one off, huh? like Captain Hook. Um, so there's a wide range of the possibilities uh, in this area and questions to be asked and thanks to archaeology and collaboration with texts, answers to be had, which give us unexpected insight into the civilization that um, uh, we've been working on, which is quite so quite remarkable. There is a question. And then there is another one on the chat. Uh, hi. Um about these prostheses, were they something made sort of ad hoc by intelligent blacksmiths and armors, or were there manuals and the uh, devices that accompanied them? Um, or were there manuals or a science of some kind um, that developed over time that people were building off of? Or were these things sort of spur of the moment or planned for the individual? Donc la question c'est, est-ce que pour les prothèses, euh, on voit qu'il y a un, un espèce de savoir-faire de, de, des armuriers ou des forgerons, etc. Est-ce qu'il y a une science qui se développe en fait, au fur et à mesure, des adaptations qui se développent au fur et à mesure, ou est-ce que c'est un peu euh, en réaction et c'est un peu, euh, on fait ça euh, dans, son, dans son jardin euh, pour, euh, pour le neveu quoi. Alors Jusqu'à la fin du Moyen-Âge, début de la Renaissance, on a des appareillages compensatoires qui sont très pragmatiques. Le forgeron, euh, une boucle de ceinture, une boucle de chaussure, on fait quelque chose de très opportuniste, individuel, pour la personne handicapée. 
So in the late Middle Ages and the, the beginning of the Renaissance period, you have something that's very opportunistic. So you have something very simple made by the blacksmith and that's adapted to the specific individual. Et à la fin du, en France, hein, à la fin du Moyen Âge, à la Renaissance, euh, toute l'Europe, la France et l'Europe, c'est un champ de bataille et il y a l'invention de l'artillerie la, de lourde et donc des mutilations sur les champs de bataille qui sont très, très, très importantes. Donc, les chirurgiens vont inventer des techniques d'amputation en brosse parée en France, qui est le, 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 plus, le plus grand des chirurgiens et le premier prothésiste de l'histoire, c'est-à-dire que il a tellement de mutilés et d'amputés à soigner qu'il va inventer des prothèses qui vont être quasiment mises sur des catalogues et diffusées à travers, à travers toute la France. C'est vraiment un tournant, la barbarie humaine et la réparation humaine. Mais ce tournant, c'est Ambroise Paré. So in France, what you see is after that, you start having um, very big scale wars in Europe, and you also have a development in the technology of wars with a lot, a lot more deadly weapons and that are doing much more damage. And so what happens is that the surgeon have to deal with more and more people to amputate. And Valérie was saying, Ambroise Paré in France, confronted to so many amputations and so many horrible deformation, actually starts to make prosthetic, uh, to adapt prosthetic and to really start having, yeah, a, a science and a method behind this. And then from there, it spreads into Europe, kind of like as a reaction. So unfortunately, once again, war does something and that spurs technological advancement. And indeed, so the, the argument, the observation that Valérie has just made is that the uh, science of prosthetics today goes back to this late medieval and Renaissance experience of uh, a new kind of warfare with devastating effects for members. Um, and then the great French surgeon, uh, having dealing with so many cases, began to develop scientific principles, uh, rational principles, uh, based on a large number of cases, tragically, for developing prostheses. Okay, um, with, uh, there was one question that um, about uh, adaptations of society that we began to answer. I just want to add to the answer that was offered earlier. Comment la société a réagi? Est-ce qu'on peut détecter des réactions sociales à ces pandémies? Um, and in the case of the first pandemic, we can indeed see, I think, clearly uh, a number of cultural and social and possibly and, and probably economic changes. One thing that's very clear is that people flee cities. When plague breaks out, people run for their lives. And when they come back to the city, they die of plague again. They learn over time, cities are not good places. Does that have a long-term consequence on the, is that involved in the dwindling away of cities from the landscape of the Mediterranean world in the sixth, seventh and eighth centuries? debate underway that hopefully our results will help to, to answer. Another important social, very important social reaction that is still with us from the second outbreak of plague, the Black Death in the 1340s was the Venetian invention of the Quarantana, of the 40 year, 40, the requirement that ships coming into port stay anchored off of Venice for 40 days Quarantana to see whether or not plague was aboard the ship. They knew if, the, if no one died on the ship, then it was okay and it could start coming in. And the reason that that terrible outbreak hit Marseille in 1720 is because the merchants who wanted their cargo in from the Ottoman Empire to make a lot of money on it when the market was hot managed to adjust the documents so that the ships came in as though they'd had quarantine and they had not. And the result was many tens of thousands of dead French folks. In the, the, the chat? Translate that? Or... Oh, oui, OK. Oui, 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 oui. <laughs> I don't know. Oui, bien sûr. Oui, pardon. Uh, donc, juste pour traduire ce que Mike vient de dire, pour notre audience française, peut-être. Uh, ce qu'on voit uh, au début, de, dans, dans la première pandémie, c'est que, par, à travers les textes, c'est que la peste uh, frappe une ville. On s'en va. 
euh, pendant une période. Et après, quand on pense que c'est passé, on revient, on se réinstalle. Mais ce qui se passe en général, c'est que quand on revient à se réinstaller, la peste est toujours là et on a encore un pic euh, de mortalité. Euh, Est-ce que c'est la raison pour laquelle on a des changements et des diminutions de, dans la taille des villes, par exemple, euh, à cette période on ne sait pas. Une des raisons. Une des raisons, ça peut, très bien, ça peut être une des raisons, mais on ne sait, on sait pas encore. Il nous faut plus de données pour pouvoir répondre à ces questions. Euh, et ce qui est intéressant aussi, c'est de voir comment on a développé euh, la réaction, encore une fois, à cette idée d'une maladie qui vient. Et les Vénitiens, donc, I didn't catch the year. What was the year? Venice? Oui, okay. well, yeah. au 14e siècle, euh, commence à mettre en place des quarantaines de, de bateaux. Donc, quand le bateau arrive, on le met en quarantaine pour vérifier que, justement, il n'y a, a pas la peste dessus. Et après, euh, on le laisse rentrer. Et ce qui s'est passé à Marseille, pourquoi on a eu la, la peste à Marseille, c'est que les, le bateau avait falsifié les documents. Et du coup, les ils avaient la peste. Les marchands à Marseille ont oui. les bateaux. Les, les marchands… Bateaux pour leur, leur dérangerait qu'ils étaient dans les bateaux. Hein. Ça, c'était les marchands même. Hein. On les a… <rire> Et du coup, forcément, le cargo et les gens qui étaient malades et qui avaient la peste se sont retrouvés à Marseille et on a eu, encore une fois, une, une épidémie. Et euh, c'est exactement comme le Covid maintenant où on décide, euh, non, c'est fini, on va s'arrêter de, de porter des masques il y a quelques euh, l'année dernière. Et à chaque fois, on voyait une réaugmentation. So we have a question on the chat from uh, Thomas Sackmar. Uh, so Thomas is asking, have you established a standard recognized protocol to archive biological samples for genetic and pathological analysis? Donc la question est, est-ce que nous avons uh, établi un standard? Ou est-ce qu'il existe un standard? Ou un protocole pour uh, enregistrer et archiver les échantillons biologiques et les données uh, génétiques et pathologique, de pathologie. Uh, donc, euh, grande question. Hein? Ah. So, this is a very big question and a very difficult question. And it is indeed one of the questions that has been at the center of our conversations for the last 72 hours. Um, there is no universally recognized protocol, so far as I'm aware, for caring for archiving and maintaining records relevant to biological Uh, relevant to individuals, remains, uh, that have been investigated for biological purposes. Um, that's one part of it. And that is, that is truly one of the questions that we've been investigating uh, very, very carefully among ourselves, because this is a very important one. Um, these are human beings. These are very precious uh, remains of human beings. They're very precious in terms of, of humanity. Uh, but also in terms of science, and they must be uh, treated with respect and care uh, so that they don't become lost or mistreated. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, it's a serious problem of archiving. It's a serious problem of ethics. It's a serious problem of the management of very large numbers of burials. Combien d'individus a-t-on fouillé en France depuis 20 ans? We've many, 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 many tens of thousands of individuals have come to light in the last few decades in France. So this is a very big problem. There is no quick answer. This is we hope to be part of the solution for this in developing a characteristic. And we'll have some thoughts on from our colleagues on that in just one second. With respect to the genetic material, um, if you take a look at our most, at mom's re most recent publication by Marcel Keller et al in PNAS tw uh, 2019, if we can get the, the camera on the reference here. Uh, uh, PNAS 2019, you'll find uh, links to um, the genetic material that um, was identified from the genomes that we have. So far, we have, as I think, nine or 10 genomes all told since 2013. More are coming and they will, of course, as with all, on, all high quality ongoing uh, international standards, uh, archaeogenetic research, those materials will all be made public and available online for all scholars and scientists to work with. Uh, but with respect to the human, the physical remains themselves, pour ce qui concerne les, les vestiges humains, humains eux-mêmes, c'est un des problèmes dont nous nous sommes occupés précisément ici. Uh, je ne sais s'il si, si y a un euh, Valérie voulait oui, okay. regarder. Non, mais ton article, 
Il y a des bases de données enfin, qu'on crée parfois des programmes avec des bases de données euh, emblématiques. Inventaire. Non, c'est ah. juste comment prendre fin. Voilà. So yeah, exactly. So we just a brief consultation among ourselves about what is the state of the amazing uh, developments that the Institut National de, Arche de Recherche Archaeologique Préventive has put together in recent decades. Um, it's quite amazing, but that is what we are working on right now in our group, and as indeed is being done in Paris and around Europe, finding a way forward uh, to archive this material in such a fashion that it is well preserved uh, and available uh, as necessary uh, through both cataloging and um, maintaining uh, good stock rooms of uh, these tens of thousands of individuals. Jeff, Dr. Ho. Hi, um, my name's Jeff Howery. I'm the Harvard Museum of Ange Near East. Um, my question is that I'm struck by your beginning slide where you are in, have documented a 1,113 localities. Can you say by looking at the soils, what degree of preservation the skeletons will be? Is there any relationship? There must be diversity of soil types and whether that infects the, the amount of, met, of uh, DNA you can get out of it. Donc, la question euh, est par rapport euh, au nombre de sites potentiels qu'on a identifiés. Je vais revenir là-dessus. Euh, si on a un moyen de voir euh, des questions de préservation, en fait. Donc, euh, je vais juste donner une première réponse. So, uh, first, the 1,113 sites, they're really, like, I wouldn't call them candidates. I would call them potential sites because of these questions of preservation. This is the known funerary landscape currently. So we're not going to sample every one of them because that would be impossible. And also, as you were saying, we do have problems of preservation. So in some regions, you're going to have extremely good preservation with very nice skeletons and we're going to be able to do a lot of studies on them and a lot of analysis and in other regions you are going to have uh just a a, a ditch or just a just a trace on the, on the soil with no skeleton left in that case there is very little we can do and there are more and more studies now about what we can actually do with the earth with the soil that's inside but this is uh, in development currently. And so our selection will also be based on the preservation and the chances of getting a positive or a negative um, answer to our questions. So we will check, we do check and we do, uh, yeah, we do record preservation and also depending on how well it's preserved, we will be able to say just on an archeological point of view, not even talking about biology and all the, wonderful analysis we can do, we can tell a lot more if it's well-preserved versus when it's not well-preserved. It's maybe the occasion to add a few words. We talked about the acidity of the soil, etc. So we, this was exactly, uh, Solana, the, our group was talking about exactly this point, Jeff. So it's very well taken. Tout ce qui, voilà, tout ce qui est et on, on a une chance folle, c'est que même si les squelettes, la matière osseuse est très mal conservée à cause du sédiment, à cause des pesticides, à cause de plein de facteurs extérieurs, y compris la façon dont le corps s'est décomposé, les prélèvements se font sur les dents et les mailles dentaires, y compris lorsqu'on incinère un corps, restent préservées très longtemps. Donc, on peut avoir une conservation du corps déficitaire si on a quelques molaires conservés, on peut quand même tester l'échantillonnage. So what Valérie was saying is that what we are very lucky uh, about is that we test teeth. And teeth, when, that's what we send to the lab for testing. Teeth are wonderful because they're not bones, they're enamel, and they preserve much better. Even in cases uh, when the body is cremated, we have teeth left and we can do things with these teeth. So even in those areas where we're going to have very poor uh, bone preservation, you might have actually the teeth. You might not have the rest of the bone or in very poor condition, but you will have the teeth. And that will allow us 
to also study if we see something unusual in the the way the grave is dug or again if we find um a grave or maybe more say more a deposition if that's the correct word in english uh in a, in a trench for example and we don't have the body but we can see the outline of uh, the, the deposition if there are teeth inside we could test it a, a, a wonderful example um that uh, you you were perhaps at martin carver who excavated for the second time sutton mm -hmm. who yeah um the, the uh, soil at sutton who in england with the great sutton who ship burial yeah. which revolutionized our understanding of early medieval archaeology in britain um the soil is extremely acidic and there was nobody there so it was a ship burial but with with a sword and with all kinds of stuff but no body and martin came up with this wonderful idea of taking uh chemical uh uh samples little vials of the sandy soil on a transect right smack dab in the middle of the ship where the sword and the shield and the call the beer brewing device whatever it was that's my oh, personal problem. hypothesis was were found and lo and behold in the uh pattern of a body uh lying in that point the chemical uh, profile of those vials of sediment showed the presence of the chemicals you'd expect from a decomposing body. And so Martin, through this brilliant um, technique, was able to show a body where there was no body. We couldn't get much, well, I don't think we get much DNA out of that one. Uh, but um, the important point that Solen has referred to is that much work is ongoing now on a new field of ancient DNA investigation in which our sister center in Leipzig is at the forefront, um, known as sediment metagenomic DNA, that is to say, fragments of DNA that are preserved in the soil. This has already played a big role in the or in studying the origins of humanity. Uh, you may know about the new branch of the human race that was discovered by our friend and colleague and member, uh, co-director of Mom David Reich, and his lab in the uh, then in the medical school, the Denisov the cave in Denisova in, in in Siberia. The soil of the cave of Denisova shows DNA not just from other Denisovans, because people were walking around, babies going pee pee and you know, all kinds of stuff, uh, food, excrement piling up in the cave, but not surprisingly sediment of cave bears at different times from the Denisovans and sediments of Neanderthals. So we have different branches of the human race over a period of many centuries and perhaps millennia moving in and out of this cave, and there are no remains uh, existent, but fragments of their DNA, which can be identified, have been um, extracted and identified from the soil. So this is a very exciting new area of research, infinitely difficult, uh, but one that probably has great promise for the future. So it's a wonderful question, Jeff, thank you. We have two more questions on the chat, if we have time. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, uh, oh, oh, sure. Uh, our good friend Donald Goldman. We should, uh, Don Goldman has a question. Do you want to give that? That's a great one. So Don Goldman has a question. Uh, what are some examples of sophisticated medical interventions? I assume that uh, these are surgical in some way, but much of the hurling probably was by crones who held considerable wisdom, some of which we might think as alternative medicine today. And in fact, the question of Etienne Cro is, yeah. is about the same, so we might as well read that yeah. one as well. So uh, the question of Etienne is, est-il possible de connaître les traitements, les types de soins apportés aux malades à travers l'étude des ossements? Is it possible to know the treatments and the type of, uh, well, yeah, treatments <laughs> uh, given to the people who are diseased or ill uh, through the study of bones? Euh, la question en anglais était, euh, est-ce qu'on a des exemples d'interventions euh, médicales sophistiquées Donc, euh, est-ce qu'on a vraiment des interventions faites par, par exemple, des chirurgiens, des spécialistes Ou est-ce que c'est plutôt quelque chose qui est fait par euh, la, la sorcière du coin ou le, le savant du coin Alors, la sorcière du coin ou le chaman du coin peut être très érudit et très, très compétent. Ah. Et euh, le mot « sophistiqué il », il revêt plein de sens différents. Moi, je cite toujours les trépanations de l'époque néolithique. 
où on a de, de vrais neurochirurgiens qui interviennent sur le crâne et le cerveau pour soulager des gens grave, en grave euh, euh, état de, 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 de souffrance, qui interviennent avec des silex, avec des pharmacopées euh, extrêmement abouties, connaissent très bien les opiacés, les champignons hallucinogènes, et qui savent euh, gérer l'après, c'est-à-dire accompagner le patient et, et, et les accompagner dans une vie euh, amoindrie. Mais en tout cas, ces gens ont des savoir-faire euh, de qualité, connaissent l'anatomie humaine, connaissent la musculature. Peut-être sont-ils à la fois chamanes et bouchers. Le lien est évident, mais on a le cas d'expérimentation animale, des trépanations faites sur des bovidés en amont de l'opération neurochirurgicale faite sur un patient humain. Et là, on est euh, 5000 ans avant notre ère. Donc, ces gens-là sont de très, très grandes compétences. Et la grande compétence, elle se déroule euh, au fil des siècles et des millénaires et elle s'adapte au savoir-faire, aux connaissances euh, médicales, chirurgicales, orthopédiques. Et bien évidemment, on voit des qualités d'intervention qui sont exceptionnelles. Extraordinaire. So to answer the first question about sophisticated medical intervention, the real question we have is what is actually a sophisticated medical intervention? So Valérie was taking the example of a Neolithic uh, surgical intervention of trepanation, so making a tiny hole in the skull of someone to relieve some, the pressure of the brain around the brain. And we can see that this these are actually surgeries and we're talking with 5,000 years BCE. So we are very, very far away from us, but there is clearly a knowledge of how the muscles are around, how the skull works and also what will relieve pain. And there is also evidence of an aftercare. So we do have people who survive this intervention. Um, and she was also mentioning that there were actually some tests made prior to intervention on humans, on animals. So they have examples of uh, cows, for example, that had uh, a trepanation. So doing it on an animal first and then moving it to uh, the human. So really a, a thought process behind the, the surgery. And I think we can use the word surgery in that case because it's really yeah. an experimental process. And of course, this knowledge then developed through the years to bring us to modern medicine. Um, the questions are rich, the discussion no less rich. Les questions ont été riches et la discussion richissime. Mais pour, pour ceux qui sont ici en présentiel, dit-on maintenant, en présentiel maintenant, nous avons la joie de vous inviter à une petite réception. For those of you who, who are here live in person, we have the joy of inviting you to a little reception to continue the discussion. For those of you who joined us from France and from Stockholm and from New York and other places that I see, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you could be here to have a glass with us, but maybe the next time. So thank you very much, the friends from INRAP, from France, and from, thank you, Lounsbury Foundation. Thank you.